without further ado. Brains, forests, companies, societies, hives, even ant colonies. At first, you might think that nothing could connect these examples besides an exceedingly awful metaphor. I mean, a brain is kind of like a society, and also kind of like an ant colony, if you squint hard enough, I guess. But if you were talking with them, you'd have to use totally different terms, almost a whole different language for each one. But what if I told you that that was wrong? What if there was some kind of fundamental similarity that connected all these different examples? What if there was one language you could use to talk about them all at the same time? Now, that's a question I've been chasing, an idea I've been searching for, before I really even knew that I was. Going through elementary school, high school, even university, I refused to give up parts of myself. I refused to choose neuroanatomy over history, or bi biology over physics, because I felt that everything was important to my understanding of myself and my world. But I had nothing to back that up, nothing to back up that feeling, that intuition, until a, a few years ago. Until last year, actually. <laughs> That's when I was sitting in a lecture given by Dr. Dimitar Sasilov. He's an astronomer who studies extrasolar planets. And he was talking about life. And what he said really stuck with me. He said, we don't have to know what life is to understand what produces it. And then I made this huge jump to one of my other courses, uh, to a survey of Western civilization. And I'd been studying this poem written 2,000 years ago by the Roman poet Lucretius. He was talking about the beginning of the world and really envisioning an atomic universe before we knew that that could have ever existed. And what he said was this. At that time, the sun's bright disk was not to be seen here, soaring aloft and lavishing its light, nor the stars that crowd the far-flung firmament, nor sea, nor sky, nor earth, nor air, nor anything in the likeness of the things that we know. Nothing but a hurricane raging in a newly congregated mass of atoms of every sort. And then I got it. We don't have to know to understand. If we were to look at the universe that he's talking about, atom by atom by atom, we'd get lost in the immensity. We'd get confused and overwhelmed. But instead, if we took a step back, if we looked at the patterns that the atoms were forming together as they were moving, we'd be able to apply the label of hurricane. We'd be able to actually understand. Now, I thought I was the only one in the world to ever thought of this idea. I was very vain and very silly. And obviously, I was wrong. But I was never, I've never been so glad to be wrong. That summer, actually, I went to a festival of arts and science called Subtle Technologies. And I was listening to Frances Wesley give a talk. She is a pioneer of social innovation in Canada. And she was talking about how the world changes, how social change happens talking about the need for understanding, for context. It was as though she was talking right to me, but she wasn't. <laughs> and she said the words complexity science. And that's when I knew that this language I've been searching for, I've been hearing behind doors, that it had a name and that it wasn't just mine. There were a whole bunch of people that were thinking the way that I was, and looking to the same questions, and it was nice to know that I wasn't alone. And I kept chasing this language, I kept learning more terms, more phrases, and that's why I'm here in front of you today. I want to share what I've learned. I want to translate complexity to bring you some of the huge ideas, the huge shifts in thinking I think it's asking us to make. So let's dive right in. Let's go to a monastery in Santa Fe, New Mexico called Cristo Rey. And it was here in 1984 that a bunch of physicists and economists, biologists, computer scientists, they all came together and they started talking. And like me in front of Francis Wesley, they found that they were all speaking the same language. Not only English, they found that they were speaking the same conceptual language. That their ideas about the fundamental structure of all things, the fundamental interconnectedness of, of all things, um, were shared. They were converging, almost. And this was incredible. Um, and they called this shared language, the same, their shared perspective, complexity science. OK, but I've said that a lot of times. What does it actually mean? What is complexity science? It's the study of complex systems. But what's a complex system? All systems are made up of agents, whether that means an um, ant in a colony or a person in a society, a neuron in a brain, all these small independent parts that are able to kind of move independently and, and act. But what's so important about complex systems is that these actions are not just separate. The agents are actually interacting, and their actions interweave. Complexity comes from, at least partially, the Greek word plectere, 
meaning to be interwoven. And the actions of, of one agent affect the entire system. So you have the, the firing of, of one neuron will affect the state of the entire brain. And the same thing works the opposite way. Thinking about a family or a society, the, action, the mindset of the society will affect each and every person in it. It's, a, it's this, this idea that you can't really pull apart the system. It's interwoven. It's very connected. Everything is together, and that really matters. But let's look at it, an actual example. Let's look back to hurricanes. I really like hurricanes. I'm going to talk to you about Edward Lorenz. He is a mathematician who, in 1963, decided that he wanted to actually model weather. He wanted to figure out why we couldn't predict what the sky would look like more than two weeks in advance. So he decided to model a small pocket of air as it moved around. He created a system of three differential equations, modeling the x, the y, and the z coordinates as they kind of moved over time. You can even see from those equations there that all the variables depend on each other. They're very much interconnected and kind of woven together. You can also see that if you plot um, the position of this air pocket over time, if you plot it only by x, y, and z separately, you see almost randomness. You don't see any kind of overwhelming pattern or structure or order. I wouldn't be able to tell you what was going on by looking at those three graphs. But that's not what Lorenz did. Instead of looking at things one-dimensionally or things by parts, looking for the atoms, he looked for the hurricane. He added an extra dimension to his view. He plotted the, the graph in 3D, x, y, and z coordinates, and traced the path of the system over time. And what he saw was beautiful. What he saw was this. I'll show you from a few different angles, because it is very beautiful. You can see that the system's actually orbiting these two very special points. And that there, even though it's not perfect, that there is a fundamental pattern to how it's moving around. There is this kind of almost hurricane, this idea we can use to understand the entire system. We wouldn't have seen that had we just looked at it part uh, x by y by z. And I think that illustrates so beautifully the first big shift in thinking that complexity is asking us to make, and that is to embrace the whole, to look for the hurricane as opposed to the atom. But I've only really given you an equation as proof of that. What can I say to, to tell you that there is this kind of pattern in order to be seen in actual systems? Is there any evidence from the real world? That's a really good question. I have a slide prepared. Wow. Um, we, we, <laughs> when you look at systems as, as diverse as human society in terms of the number of deaths that have happened during given wars or even the internet, um, in terms of how computer sites um, are organized, or if you look at bacteria and how the different proteins they have interact with each other, you see a very similar pattern in how um, the systems are all, all laid out. You see this. Now, it's very it really has no reason to be that similar. Um, and what those graphs all really are are just, I'll show you a kind of blown up example. They're, they're all power laws. So you have some kind of parameter at the bottom, whether that's a, a population of a city or the frequency of a certain word in a book or the number of deaths for wars. And then you have the number or percentage of, of things that have that, that value. So you can see that there are very few cities that have um, a lot of people living in them and a lot that have a few, and that makes intuitive sense. So what's, but what's important about these graphs is how they're actually decreasing, how they're changing from many to few. And that's by a power law or an exponential relationship. And not only is that important because it shows that there's some kind of fundamental, again, like pattern to be seen, there's something similar across all these very different examples. Um, the power law is relevant because we're supposed to be thinking of things in terms of bell curves, in terms of one mean, one central mean, and things dropping off on either side very, very quickly. And for things that are, can be understood by um, bell curves, you can kind of ignore parts of the system. You can just say, there won't be somebody who's going to be 12 feet tall or 0 0.2 feet tall for talking about heights. So you can kind of limit your understanding of the system to, um, to this very constrained area of probability. But with power laws, we can't do that. With power laws, we don't have that same dropping to zero so fast, and you can't ignore parts of the system. For thinking about this in terms of maybe an, an earthquake, and that dotted line represents an 8.0 on the Richter scale, it's almost just as likely that we're going to have something that's on uh, 12.0. So you can see that we can't do the same thing. We, we can't reduce or break apart. We can't look at parts instead of the whole. And that's really important because it challenges what we like to do. We, we like to control, predict, to break things down, and make things simple. With complexity, we can't actually do that. And that, I think, is the, the second huge shift in thinking that we're being asked to make. 
to move from our ideas of friction and control to something else, something maybe a little bit more scary. But I don't think it has to be scary. Of course, it's almost terrifying to think that we don't have absolute control. But I think it's almost more realistic to look at ourselves as being a part of as opposed to outside of these systems. That anything we do has to have an, an, uh, an effect, have to have some kind of reaction to it. So instead of trying to apply these very rigid frameworks of, of understanding, we should look at ourselves more carefully and look at how we fit. But how do we even go about doing that? It's also a very good question. I have another slide prepared. We um, end up making a lot of small bets. And you can see this idea happening in terms of evolution, or even in business as well. And it's this idea that we try a lot of very small things. We're talking about an ant colony, and they're trying to explore the environment and find food. The ants will start crawling out in all different directions. And those that reach a food source will come back and take more with them the next time. You have this almost scaling up of things that work and pulling back of things that don't work. And over time, you have entire columns of ants going towards a food source. Or you have a company that's able to adapt its product to uh, better fit its, its, its audience or its market. Um, and that's great, because it allows the system to be flexible and resilient. It's almost this tension between exploring and exploiting its environment, where you have um, the ability to not assume you know, but to try to understand by um, testing things over time. And a really relevant example, perhaps, is thinking about drug companies. When um, they're trying to dis discover the next new drug, the, the best um, fit for whatever target they're trying to um, aim at, they end up producing a whole bunch of different computer models that they allow to be tested over time, and then they almost let it evolve by mutating the, the code of the computer s simulation. So over time, they find that they'll reach structures that are much more beautiful, much better fits than they would have had they just decided that they know and try to model it from, from the get-go. So this more fluid, organic way of going about your life, going about making decisions, um, is inherent in complexity, I think, and can also really lead you to a better solution, if, if, if there really is one. And also, a, a case in point, I guess, myself, when I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do, I did this idea of making small bets. I explored the internet, I like, went to lots of lectures, and, and then I found this, and that, that's why I'm here in front of you today, by the process of not assuming I know what I'm going to like, but trying, and then learning and reflecting, and then kind of iterating, going again and again and again over that process. But before I send you off with this whole idea, you can apply this, this set of thinking to everything in your life. I want to make sure you know that a pizza is not a pizza is not a complex system. Neither is a car or a printing press. And this idea of complexity science is one perspective am among many. It's not the be-all and end-all of science. And just to think that it is would turn it into some kind of buzzword. It wouldn't have any relevance anymore. And I don't want that, and I don't think that you want that either. So it's really important to recognize when you can use this, when a system is complex, and when it's actually not. And you can use some other um, way of, of going about it. But still, I think that the fundamental ideas that complexity is bringing to us, and things I've talked about today, um, being embracing the whole, or rethinking our ideas of prediction and control, even testing, thinking, repeating that kind of that small bats model to approaching our lives are relevant to a lot of things. Because a lot of our systems that we care about, they are complex. So we're talking about societies or understanding our brains better, understanding economies better. There's huge applications. But still, if you take nothing else from, from what I've said, I would love you to come away with this idea that I actually stumbled across when I bought a book for 30 cents at a used book sale last summer in, in Toronto. And it's, it's this idea that the breakage is in the perceiver, not the perceived. There is coherence in the universe, harmony in the cosmos, deeper and more comprehensive than we know. And that's really important. More comprehensive than we know, but not too comprehensive to be able to understand if we look for hurricanes instead of atoms. So thank you for being so attentive and bearing with me.